I just want to talk to you a little bit from my heart for a few minutes. I had planned to do this last week, but uh, how many enjoyed uh, Ron McIntosh when he was here a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half ago or so? And uh, we have guest speakers, and I, I wanted to address something because uh, we had a Wednesday night service. Ron's been here, that's the one, two, three, third time, I think. And uh, I really enjoy Ron and his ministry. And Ron, let's say uh, Ron McIntosh, uh, uh, how many like Festa Soha when he comes? How about Tracy Stewart came last year. She's coming to the end this year. I mentioned those three because they minister in the Spirit. That is, they let the Holy Spirit do things through them when they're here. And often when we have uh, uh, guest speakers that come, we allow them to have a Sunday night. We don't normally have a Sunday night service, so we did with Ron. We usually do with Festus. And Tracy, she comes, we'll do a Sunday night. Because, you know, there's just a different ministry in the Holy Spirit. How many think that's good? So, you know, I cut my spiritual teeth 1976 in, in a ministry, and, and I mean, it was all about the Holy Spirit, and you know, it was the mid-70s, and the charismatic movement was in full force, and us uh, ex-Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopal, Catholic, etc., were excited about God being out of the box we had placed him in, and it was awesome, uh, but there were some uh, things that we did that I saw that were problematic, and so I just wanted to bring an encouragement Sunday night, Ron McIntosh was awesome, but he ministered prophetically to a number of people in the front that Sunday night. And I was tagged of the Lord to just mention, and this is my role as pastor. A pastor is like a shepherd. And a shepherd's out in the field. And when I'm in Africa, I see shepherds and sheep. Or it could be goats. Or, or one time I saw 200 camels with shepherds. <laughs> camels, yeah. But they're corralling them and keeping them all from falling in the ditch, ditch in the brambles or getting hurt in some way. And so that's my role as a pastor. So I just want to bring some encouragement. If you receive a word from the Lord from someone, how many know what I mean by a word from the Lord? Uh, an inspired utterance, a prophecy, when the Holy Spirit moves and someone says, well, I believe the Lord's saying this to you. How many know you need, you need to watch what you do with that? So this is a pastoral admonishment to watch what you do with that. Again, there are gifts of the Spirit that we should be expecting God to use us in, not just in the four walls in the church, but more expressly outside. So, so there are nine spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, the gift of faith, working of miracles, gifts of healings, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and then the gift of prophecy. Now, the word prophecy... New Testament uh, uh, simply means, in its simplest form, inspired utterance. That means words inspired by the Holy Spirit as a person speaks. Uh, my experience with prophecy started in my, uh, in my private praying time. And I'm just a Baptist boy that got baptized in the Holy Spirit, almost 18. And I'm praying in the Spirit. And I just, I've never done that before. I got baptized with the Holy Spirit. And... Boy, this is all new, and, and I was just by myself, and I would have times of prayer. I'd pray for five minutes or ten minutes or, you know, whatever, and just pray. But, but, but something happened while I'm praying for the first time in my life. Something rose up inside me, and it felt like a balloon blew enough. It's like, what in the world? And, and while I'm praying, uh, it's like, God, what, what is this? I had never experienced the power of God and been in church for almost 18 years. But when it came then prophecy, that gift rose up inside me. And I said, wow. And I spoke it out in my, just, just by myself in my prayer time. I said, what in the world? And I found out that's prophecy. And then when I went to Bible school, I found out that those that taught spiritual gifts, you find out, you know, what, what God, God does in public, he'll do first of all in private. And, and that's what happened with me. So let me talk a little bit about the gift of prophecy or inspired utterance. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 3 the Apostle Paul says, but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So when someone prophesies to you, like we have guest speakers, like Ron did for a few here uh, Wednesday night, week and a half, uh, Sunday night, week and a half ago. You know, um, it's one thing to, to prophesy, and prophecy simply is to encourage us, draw us near to God, and, and you know, just, just buoy us up in the Lord. But that's the simple gift. If anybody ever comes to you and says, you know, I believe the Lord has a, a word for you. In fact, the truth is, as a pastor, I'll be standing beside somebody. And sometimes when I shake a person's hand, words come. That's all, they rise up right here, rise up. And I know it's the Holy Spirit. I say, you know, 
and, and I'll say something, to, and, and I usually say this, blah, 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 whatever it is, and then I'll say, um, um, does that mean something to you? And most, all the time, the person, well, yeah, yeah, it means a lot. I say, okay, well, just let the Lord minister that to you. Now, what I don't mean is live by it. How many hear what I just said? Let it encourage you. So let me uh, say that uh, prophecy is not to guide us and to lead us. The simple gift of prophecy encourages us. But if somebody comes to you, up to you in a Bible study or, or at another church or at a meeting in the town and it's a Holy Spirit kind of meeting or, or here and we have a guest speaker like we did a week and a half ago and they give you a personal word from the Lord, understand this. If somebody just gives you an encouraging word, that's one thing. But when they say, here's what I believe the Lord is saying to you and it gives you something about your future, it just left the simple gift of prophecy. And that is the word of wisdom. The gift of the Spirit, the word of wisdom, is a supernatural knowing by the Holy Spirit of uh, things that will come to pass. That's future things. And that's the word of wisdom. The word of knowledge is when God gives you uh, a word. And I just had one tonight, you know. I said, somebody's in here wrestling with yourself, forgiving yourself. Well, that would be a word of knowledge. I had no way of knowing that somebody in here is dealing with that probably or the crowd this side there probably is but I know pointedly there was somebody that was really wrestling with themselves and it may be more than one so that was a word of knowledge word of knowledge is when God, God gives you uh, facts about things that are happening now or happened in the past word of wisdom something in the future so when somebody says well here's what I believe God's saying to you blah 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 and it's future well let me tell you what you don't do with it you don't live by it that is, you can write it down. You say, well, that's encouraging. What it should do, it shouldn't be revelation. It should be confirmation. So when God, somebody gives you a word from the Lord, it should confirm what's already in your own heart. For instance, Susan and I, I mentioned this one night this week talking on prayer. March the 20th, 1988 was a Sunday, 6 p.m. service. A guy by the name of Dick Mills was there. And this man had an ability, I mean, it was an unusual anointing. He would look at you and get 25 scriptures. His board said, hone it down to five. And he had an assistant. He would look at you and say, blah, 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 and give you five scripture. And he looked at, he said, young man, stand up. Well, after I, you know, grab gulp, <laughs> stand up, you know. Uh, he, and Susan, stand up. So Susan and I stood up that night. And he gave us five scriptures, I've got them, and he said, it's turnaround time. And when he said what he said, it is as though he was standing, s sitting beside me or kneeling beside me while I'm praying. That's how real the, I said, my Lord, God is real. I mean, my goodness, how would he ever know that about me? He said exactly what I've been saying to God in prayer. Now, that was a supernatural sign to me. Does that make sense? However, I didn't live by it. How many hear me? So prophecy is never to guide us. And personal prophecy, you never look to it for guidance. And if somebody gives you a personal word, you know, I've got an invisible shelf, I always say over here somewhere, that I put things on. I say, well, that's wonderful. But, you know, I generally don't, if somebody prophesies to me, I generally don't do anything with it. How many hear me? Prophecy is not for personal guidance. Prophecy is for encouragement. And it is to only confirm something you've already got from the Lord. How many get that? So that's just something I wanted to share tonight. Back, uh, in fact, back in 1976, when I came to the Lord and got filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, I was just really just a couple of weeks old in the Lord, and we just had some dynamic services as churches did in the mid-1970s in the height of the charismatic movement, which was a movement where denominational people were introduced to all things Holy Spirit, and they weren't accustomed to those things in their denominational churches. So, uh, so here I am, it's all new, and... And uh, so I was up front, and the pastor was praying over people. And he come up to me, and I don't even think I've ever said this publicly. I, I don't even think Susan knows what I'm about to say. Because I haven't said anything about it. He come up to me, and he said something. And he said, you're going to be a pastor. Now, I like swallowing my tongue. <laughs> be because I wouldn't, I wouldn't even talk to you, make eye contact with you to talk to you. Much less get up in public to speak to people. Are you kidding me? Pastor. So that made me feel. But you know, I did nothing with it. It wasn't until like six months later, God really called me into ministry, but I didn't let that call me into ministry. How many hear me? So don't take personal prophecy and uh, guide your life with it. It should only confirm what you already have 
uh, from the Lord. Uh, 1977, I'd been in the first Bible school I was in for a few months, and you know, again, the 70s was a different kind of time, and uh, the students and all, we were all after a service, had a little afterglow up front, and we got to singing in, in a you know, little circle and got to praying, and, and then we, people got the, prophet, the gift of prophecy started manifest. And one of the students looked at the other one and said, Thus saith the Lord, you're going to have the largest ministry anybody's ever had. You're going to be the, the most fiery evangelist the world has ever known. And the moment the guy started speaking, I said, That guy's Looney Tunes. <laughs> I, I thought, I didn't say it out loud. That guy's crazy. That guy's crazy. <laughs> you know, that's nuts. Uh, and, you know, the guy that he prophesied to was kind of like, because he's a Bible school student, you know, kind of green behind the ears, wet behind the ears. What do you do with that? Well, you know, uh, you hadn't heard anything from that guy. He, he never came to the flaming evangelist. See, prophecy never centers on you. It centers on Jesus. It never magnifies you. It magnifies Christ. How many hear what I'm saying? And number one, it agrees with the Bible, the Word of God. So just be aware, these kind of things happen sometimes. Susan and I, in 1978, went to uh, the technical school in our hometown, and there was a, a guest speaker there, and they had a m- number of charismatic churches that worked together to bring this prophet to town. And this was in 1978. I think you were in Bible school then? Did you start going to Bible school in 1978? We met in Bible school, by the way, at night. And uh, anyway, you full-time then, 1978, right? Yeah, because you worked second year. So anyway, Susan and I started dating in 1978. Our first date was Ju- July 1st, 1978. It was a Thursday night. I won't tell you all the rest of it, but that was it. And so a couple of months later, you know, a couple of months later, we're going to this, uh, we're going to this uh, technical college, you know, the little auditorium they got. And this prophet was there, and a bunch of people were there, and different pastors were there and such. And, and after the guy ministered, and we're in the afterglow, everybody's talking, and you're talking to your friends and such. And Bible school students are crazy, mostly. You know, really. And so we're talking, you know, and all excited. And, and this, pastor from, this pastor from the cross town came up to Susan, and we'd just been dating a few months. And he said, you know what the Lord's saying? I looked at her, and she looked at me, and we looked at him. So, huh? What? He said, I believe God's sending you to the island of Pago, Pago. And you're going to be a missionary. I'm not make. did that happen? I ain't making that up. He said that, and I'm like, I didn't know what to say. She didn't know what to say. We said, okay. And I'll never forget, uh, Susan had bought a 1978 Camaro. That was a beautiful car, y'all. It was all motor. We sat down in her car, and she let me drive her new car. And I sat down, and I said, you didn't tell me anything about Pago Pago <laughs> when we started dating. And she said, I didn't know anything about it either. I said, maybe we ought to just forget that. How many understand? Yeah, so the idea, so, you know, it, it was a, you know, I thought about that for years later because, you know, over the years I've had people, you know, we were at a church in Tulsa and that's where I was apprenticed in ministry and a lot of people and stuff. And, you know, people get excited sometimes. And I've had varying people that, you know, have some caliber in the Lord, some speakers and, you know, people that are, have some acclaim and are well-known and such and known to be used by God that way, say things to me. You know what I never do? I never let it guide me. And even if I've never heard it before, I just say, okay. But I don't do anything with it because you know what? If it's God, it'll happen. And I don't have to make it happen. I don't have to force it to happen. How many hear me? Again, prophecy is not for guidance. We get our guidance from the Lord. Listen to Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led or guided by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So, God didn't put prophecy, the gift of prophecy in the New Testament church to guide us. No, he's given us the Holy Spirit on the inside. He's given us two things to give us guidance. He's given us, he's given us number one, how many know the Word of God? Secondly, he's given us the Holy Spirit. Then perhaps number three, the witness of the Spirit. Because Romans 8, 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So I just want to encourage everybody as we go through and we have services and, you know, people... 
you know, minister and, and uh, ministers come and minister, or you're just in a Bible study somewhere or maybe attending a service somewhere else in the city and somebody prophesies personally to you, don't live by that. Just let, leave it alone. And if it's God, it'll come to pass. I make a note of things. I have a journal. I started journaling in 1985. And I write things down. I write dreams I have down. I write desires I have down. I write thoughts I have down. And if somebody gives me a quote-unquote word, I write it down. And I put a date on it. And then, you know, if it happens, they're like, well, look at that. Well, look at there. They were right. Look. But I don't think about it again. Honestly, I hardly think about it again. And I don't think that's demeaning to the person that gave it. I just think that's smart because I know that I have to hear from God for me. How many hear me? My mother is a really pray, uh, prays a lot and has for all of her spiritual life since 1975. And when I was very young in the Lord, she would, she would tell me what's going to be happening to me. And I finally went up to her and said, Mama, I love you, but don't talk to me like that anymore. Because I found out I can't be led by prophecy. I can't be led by Mama. I have to be led by the Word and by the Holy Spirit, right? All of us are the same way. So learn to get your guidance from the Lord. Listen to Proverbs twenty twenty seven. Y'all hear? Everybody okay? Proverbs twenty twenty seven says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. So what's that scripture saying? God will guide us where he lives in us. God, the Holy Spirit doesn't live in your head. He doesn't live in your emotions. He doesn't live in the physical frame of your body, but he does live inside your body in your spirit nature. And uh, sometimes the Bible uses the term heart as the center core of us. And the spirit nature of man is sometimes called the heart of man. It's the seat of affection and it's the seat of, of all we are. And that's where the Holy Spirit is. Let me give you several translations of Proverbs twenty twenty seven. They bring perhaps better light on that scripture. The human spirit, this is complete Jewish Bible says the human spirit is the lamp of Adonai. And that's an endearing Old Testament term for Lord. It searches one's inmost being. He calls the heart the inmost being. Then um, English Standard Version, the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his inmost parts. He calls it inmost parts. King James, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Talking about the center core of us. The Rotherham emphasized Bible, the lamp of Yahweh is the spirit of a son of earth, searching all the chambers of the inner man. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, And then here, uh, a couple of more here, amplified the spirit of man, that factor in human personality which proceeds immediately from God, is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost parts. So again, you know, when I'm looking for God to guide me, I'm not looking out here. I'm looking in here. And so regardless of you may be young in the Lord, you may be a few months old, a few weeks old in the Lord, you may be a few years old in the Lord or a seasoned believer with many decades in your life in the Lord, all of us need to learn to tune in to our inner person. And let me just say for me, uh, experientially, um, I think the biggest factor for me, if you're in the Word... Your spirit nature has to become familiar with God's Word. If you're not familiar with the Word of God, you're really on, in dangerous territory. And we have a whole generation of people now that want experiential Christianity at the expense of knowing the Word. And let me just say, you don't know the presence of God nor the Holy Spirit of God without being totally familiar with the Word of God. How many hear what I just said? I made it, and I don't, nobody really, when I first came to Jesus, I was not quite 18, and I was one, you know, it was right around, you know, uh, 1977, y'all remember, anybody remember Jim Jones? Mm -hmm. The Kool-Aid man, everybody drank, 900 something people, I mean, committed suicide. That was the rage of the day, and and as a young man, it's like, oh man. So for me, it's like, God, I, I don't want anybody to deceive me. If I go to a church, it's like, I don't know that pastor. I don't know those people. But God, I know you. And if I know you, and, and then I'm reading books. And books are, I love books. I, I, books are my friends. But I'm thinking, if I'm reading a book, I, I don't even know that author. He might be telling me something that's not true. And now, y'all, now, there is such disinformation everywhere. 
Everybody gives their opinion about what happened, and it may not be the bare bones factual truth. How many get it? So as a young man, no kidding, I, because I guess the signs of the times is like, God, I don't want to be deceived. So I knew intuitively, if I don't want to be deceived, know the Bible for myself. And so I made it my goal to know that I read the word. Y'all, I read the word. I'd read it at lunch. I would, I'd read it on break, and uh, the guys would pick on me at work. I'd read it at night for hours. I just read, I read the New Testament through over and over and over. Read the Old Testament, and I've been doing it for years and years. And you know what? When you get acquainted with the word, it gives you confidence in God. When you get acquainted with the Word, it gives a seedbed for the Holy Spirit to speak. And I used to, uh, I was crying and whining one day, years and years ago. I'd just known the Lord for a couple of years. I said, God, you never, all these people come in there saying, God said this, and God said, you don't ever talk to me. What about me? You don't ever talk to me. And I was somewhere, uh, and somebody was ministering, and he said, if you've ever had a scripture come up to your mind, and you weren't even thinking about it. It just floats up. Guess what? The Holy Spirit just witnessed to your spirit and spoke to you. And I found out that God will speak to you by the word number one. How many hear me? And if you'll pay attention to the word, he may go a step further and then talk to you, you know, in other ways, in practical ways about where you should work, who you should marry, how you should spend your time, where you should go to church, what you should do with this, what you should do with that. But if you don't magnify the word first, you give him no platform to speak specific things how many got that so that's not in my notes psalm 37 4 is a y'all give me about another five minutes or so i'll be done psalm 37 4 delight yourself in the lord and he will give you the desires of your heart you can interpret that two ways delight yourself in the lord and he'll give you things you like or delight yourself in the lord that is pour yourself into him and he will give you the desires of your heart or he will place in you what he has for you. Now that has, is what has set me free. When I was a young man, I knew God had called me, but I did not know what to do with the call except go to Bible school. I went to two, found a wife at one. Then the wife and I went to another one. I've been to another one since then. But, uh, you know, it's like, oh, God, how do you do this? How do I get in ministry this way? What, what am I going to do? How do I do this? And do you, what am I supposed to be, evangelist? Am I supposed to be a missionary? Am I supposed to be a pastor? What am I supposed to do? And, and, and the scripture kept coming to me, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. And, and the desire in me. Though I can't describe the, the innate desire. I can, and let's see, my mind goes back. 1980, 81. I've been to two Bible schools by then. And y'all... This insatiable desire in me to help people love Jesus. To, to help them understand the Word. I would have conversations with people and end up, we'd just end up talking about the Word all the, all the time. And through that, God said, well, I, uh, number one, the first thing He called me to do was be a teacher. And then later on, it was a pastor. Where did all that start? Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the body. And then 1 Corinthians 2.11 says this, New King James, For what man knows the things of a man or woman, except the spirit of man which is in him, Here's uh, God's Word translation. After all, who knows everything about a person except the person's own spirit? That's good, isn't it? And then J.B. Phillips' translation, for who could really understand a man's inmost thoughts except the spirit of man himself? Now see, that, that's, that's a, a wealth of, of understanding right there. There are things that your spirit nature knows that you don't know, that your mind is not acquainted with. So, you know, if you're a wise believer, you'll learn to begin to live from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's, it's not an external stimuli. It's an internal yearning that you're always looking for. So a wise believer will get up in the morning and say, Hello, Father. What do you have planned today? And then he's always or she's always listening inside. As you're tooling through the day, as you're driving wherever you go, as you're working and 
having conversations with people. See, I've learned to have an ear to all this that's going on out here, but then also, you've got two sets of ears. You've got your outward ears, that amount of big, and then you have inner ears. Jesus said, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. A lot of people have ears, but they're not hearing. They're only hearing the external. Learn to hear the internal. And you do that, you've got to spend some quiet time. That's a problem today because of all of our electronics. You've got to be willing to get quiet. Sometimes get in your car and don't turn anything on. Here, during this Daniel thing, lots of times I just keep the radio off, keep stuff off. I'm listening to the MP3s and this all the time. I just cut it off, just quiet. Because when you get quiet, you can hear. How many hear me? If you've got too much mental activity, you don't. So who can really understand a, man, a, a man's or a woman's inmost thoughts except the spirit of the person themselves? So here's, uh, as I close, let me encourage you to do this. So um, I spend some time every day praying in the spirit. If you don't know what that is, it's praying in other tongues. I'm guilty. I do it every single day. And I try to spend an hour a day praying in the Spirit. Let me tell you what happens when you pray. When you pray in the Spirit, your spirit, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, the Amplified says, by the Holy Spirit within you praise. Now just think about what's happening with the activity of praying in the Spirit, i.e. praying in other tongues. When you're praying in tongues, you're actually activating your human spirit. And your human spirit is praying motivated by the Holy Spirit. I always ask myself these questions. Is the Holy Spirit God? Yes. Does God know everything? Yes. Does He know your past? Yes. Your present? Yes. Your future? Yes. Does He know His high, God's highest and best for you? Yes. So then does the person who dwells inside of you, who is God, know everything that you need to know to be successful in life? So if you're praying by the Holy Spirit within you, when you're praying in the Spirit, guess what you're doing? You're praying and He's enabling you to pray out the will, purpose, and plan of God for your life. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses, for we know not what we should pray for as we should, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Let's talk about praying in the Spirit. And verse 27 of Romans 8 says, He that searches the heart knows what the mind or the will of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What better way to pray than pray the will of God? Then verse 28 of Romans 8 says, And we know that all things work together, amplified says, and are fitting a pattern for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. So the wise believer, Mr. and Ms. Believer, you take some time every day, you pray in the Spirit, you know what you're doing? You're becoming, number one, acquainted with your insides, sensitive to your spirit nature, and because you're becoming sensitive to your spirit, you're also becoming sensitive to the Holy Spirit and to the yearnings on the inside. And when you delight yourself in the Lord, He's placing inside of you what He has for you. How many hear what I'm saying? If you'll just spend some time with those, just amazing. So if somebody says something to you and it's a prophecy, a word from the Lord, well, if it confirms what you got inside, say, well, thank you. That's all. Go write it down and just let God do it. How many hear me? But you know, let me tell you what, if you live this way, it gives you some tremendous confidence in life. How many hear me? So I'll give you one illustration. I was praying, I close. I was uh, praying in the Spirit. Uh, the second Tuesday of November 1993, I had been pastoring a guy's church for him for not quite a year. The pastor of the church in my hometown, Florence, South Carolina, was Carl Morris. And he uh, went on a missionary endeavor and moved his entire family, two children, his wife and he, moved to Leopaya, Latvia, a city on the Baltic Sea. And they started a church. There's a missionary endeavor, and we paid his full-time salary. I pastored his church in his stead for him stateside, and we supported them full-time uh, on the mission field. And so while I was doing that that year, God did a whole lot in me. But that November, he was coming back. He left January 93, came back January 1994. So here it is, November of 93, a couple of months, he's coming back. And I'm giving the pastor's church back to him. And I'm thinking, well, God, what, 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 you got, what you got for me? What, what about me? What about me? How many know God knows your thoughts? Here's how God is. If you know anything about God, you'll know this. 
He will talk to you in the lingo you think in. If you think in, in, uh, in South Carolina colloquialisms, he'll give you a South Carolina colloquialism. If you have Texas expressions or Mississippi expressions or North Carolina expressions, he will use them because he uses your thoughts. How many get it? And so I mind it, and, and he can say something and just say two words and you get it because you know that's, you think that way. So I was uh, praying in the spirit and I usually do it, used to, I'd walk back and forth because I'd go to sleep otherwise, but uh, now I can just kneel down and pray and I won't go to sleep. And, uh, and so I was kneeling down praying in the spirit and I, second Tuesday of November, 1993, and I prayed almost an hour and I heard after I finished praying, it's about an hour, I heard and God knew, now God, what, he, that I was thinking, God, what do you have for me? And on the heels of me thinking that inside for several weeks, that day when I got up from praying, I heard already existing church. Well, that's not my thought. I wasn't even thinking about that. Where'd that come from? It floated up from here. And as I continued to pray in the Spirit, day after day, week after week, six months later, May 16th, 1994, the pastor had come back in January and I was his associate pastor. And we were doing our stuff and had a little Bible school going on, all kinds of stuff. And I sat him down in his office. He came by my office, nine o'clock in the morning. I looked at the clock. I'm a very specific thinking person. And uh, his name's Carl. I said, Carl, I need you. I need to talk to you. I said, for six months and I told him my experience that already existing church turned into somewhere in the world there is a church that has no pastor and you're going to pastor that church I had already been on staff at churches had been a, a, a staff team member then I'd started churches but I'd never taken a church over somebody else's start so he said already existing church to me so I said somewhere in the world that was May 16th 1994 it was a Monday that's the very day that the pastor of what was this church, a different name, was dismissed. Isn't that strange? I found out about that five months later. So when I came here and I was voted in as pastor, there's not one devil in hell that could convince me that I wasn't in the will of God. How many hear me? So, you know, when you have those kinds of experiences in life, you can learn to trust that inward witness. So several encouragements here. Don't be led by someone else's word from the Lord for you. Don't be led by outward stimuli, outward circumstances. Number one, get in the word. Secondly, pray, pray in the spirit. Become acquainted with your own insights. And let me say, when I said that, the Holy Spirit just tagged me. To, to sometimes to become acquainted with your insides, you've got to be willing to let God deal with some debris. Scar tissue. How many from hurts, pains, losses, abuse, neglect, lack, need? You've got to be willing to get quiet and say, God, I let this go, I let this go, I let this go, I let this anger go, I let this unkindness go, I let these words go, I let this, like she's unforgiveness go, I let, you've got to let things go because sometimes that clouds you up inside so much that you can't hear the Holy Spirit. How many hear me? So all this, all I'm saying is a huge process. And y'all, this is the day to learn to hone in and listen to the Lord and become sensitive to your own spirit so you, we can be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and listen to what He's saying inside. Let me say this. Uh, over the years of times, God sometimes will say things that you don't want to hear. He'll ask you to do things you don't want to do. But you know, when you learn and you train your ear to hear His voice, when you know He's saying something, you'll say yes. Because you know, like the 1950s television program, Father Knows Best. Stand up on your feet. Did y'all get something out of that?